On my honor, I will never betray my badge, my integrity, my character, or the public trust. I will always have the courage to hold Well, Dan, way. welcome to the show. Hey, Wayne, appreciate you letting me on. Absolutely. We had the opportunity to meet over there at PodFest, and I tell you what really stood out to me was the passion that you have for the topics that we're going to be discussing in the areas of PTS um, and what's been going on in that military and law enforcement space. Yeah, I get, I get kind of excited, so you'll have to forgive me. Sometimes I just don't shut up, but uh, yeah, it, it was good to meet you over there, and man, I just got so much knowledge that I never expected to get out of uh, an event. I think PodFest was amazing. You know, I same, and the connections too. I really, yep. that being over there in that environment, it, it's been really good. And I think I've actually made some lifelong friendships out of it. Right, exactly. So, Well, let me, every guest I have on the show, I like to start out with some break the ice kind of questions. So let me okay. just throw a few of those at you. Coffee or tea? Oh, definitely coffee. Okay, that's a good answer. Any preferred, doesn't have to be a brand, but any preferred type of coffee? Um, I'm probably medium to dark roast. Okay. But no, no real brands, just regular black coffee. Okay, good call. Any favorite place to have that cup of coffee? Like a place that brings you peace, tranquility? <sighs> um, you know, I, I like to sit out on my porch and read. So in the mornings, I'll go outside when it's not too hot out and get the outside air. And, and uh, especially now being cooped up in the house, I, I really enjoy getting out and doing that. So yeah, my front porch probably. Very good. It's nice to have that respite every once in a while. Oh yeah, definitely. Best or worst travel story? Oof. I'm going to go, well, let's see. My, my wife and I, when we got married back in 2016, our honeymoon was to, to the island of Oahu in Hawaii. And the trip out there was horrendous. We got stuck at an airport. Um, they canceled a flight. You, know, you pay all this money for first class, and then you, know, you can't get on. You're going to be like 16 hours late getting in. And I think that was probably my worst um, travel story as far as, you know, local commercial. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be flying to uh, Iraq or Afghanistan. Those would definitely qualify. But yeah. yeah, I've never done the latter there. And I can just imagine those flights. I know when domestic flights get held up for hours and you're spending um, hours. I had a trip once to Indiana that should have taken me two hours. And I think 16 hours later, I landed. And yeah, it was yeah. a very frustrating trip. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what is the, um, what's your favorite quarantine activity? I have to ask a timely question. Oh, Lord. Um, I'm going to say read. It's, let, let's me catch up on reading. Um, you know, cause we don't have cable in the house, so we don't, I don't watch much television. So, Very good. Yeah, so let reading. me ask you when it comes to reading any, uh, favorite nonfiction books that you're reading right now, or do you prefer fiction? Um, I prefer nonfiction, actually, things to kind of help the mind grow. I'm, I'm reading a book now called The Infinite Game by Simon Sinek. Highly recommend it. Okay, yeah. Highly recommend it. Uh, and most of his writings, as well as his teachings, are, can be life-changing. So Simon yeah, Sinek he's, he's, pretty, he's a pretty cool guy. Very cool. Well, let me ask you, Dan. Um, I had the opportunity uh, to – you're affiliated with a company 22 to 0. Um, and you could tell us a little bit about that. But I, on there, I had an opportunity to kind of look at your bio and what you did uh, during your time in the service. Can you just tell us a little bit about that and kind of where you started, maybe even taking us back to like Afghanistan 2011? Yeah, sure. So um, after 9-11, I went back into the Army. Uh, I was working, my career kind of went military, college, law enforcement, back into the military, back into law enforcement. And at 48, I finally figured out what I wanted to do when I grow up. And that's, that's the nonprofit. But um, in 2013, I was in Afghanistan as an infantry squad leader, um, which means I had two four-man fire teams. And then I had a gun team attached to me and a radio operator. So basically responsible for about 10 guys, 10, 11 guys usually. Um, half my guys in the deployment got medevaced out of Afghanistan for injuries sustained in combat. Uh, one of my kids was was killed um, in late July of 2011. I was taking a joint patrol across uh, the Tarnak River in the Zabal province of Afghanistan, and we were going to conduct a link up with our um, striker unit and get food for the Afghan contingent that were assigned to us because they wouldn't eat our MREs. We had to get kosher halal meals for them. 
and I stepped on a pressure plate detonating an IED about five, 10 feet away, um, which resulted in a pretty significant um, TBI. Um, they, they classified it as a moderate traumatic brain injury versus a mild. And um, lingering effects for, were lack of sleep. Um, I would say the, the hardest part about doing combat operations with no sleep is you basically become a zombie. And, and it was miserable. And the day that we lost Doug, he was, he, was a, um, he was one of the assistant gunners to my gun team, was driving a striker that day. We went off road um, across this area called Route Snake. And it was a, what they called a black route, which means it wasn't cleared. And my job is lead striker truck commander is to make sure I, I try to identify any threats along the roadways. Um, obviously, the improvised explosive devices are the are the biggest threat, especially off road. And when the IED blew up behind me in the convoy, I realized that we'd rolled right over it along with uh, two, three other strikers. So um, that was the day we lost Doug. And and man, I was, you know, I pretty much hated myself after that. You know, because it's one thing to take the enemy, take a life of the enemy of the United States. Uh, but it's totally different when you feel responsible for the death of an American service member. So right. I really struggled with that quite a bit. Um, and I think I was more ticked off at myself because uh, probably shouldn't have been up in the front of the convoy. I probably should have said something after the IED blast, you know, to let somebody else take point. Um, but, you know, I just, ego kind of gets in the way and we always want to do our jobs and, and, uh, you know, and then, as my deployment was was rounding down to a closeout, we had about three weeks left. I got a Red Cross notification, and I had to go home early because my mother passed away. So, you know, I'd say my my world was really really flipped upside down at that point. Um, you know, when you have four kids leave country, don't come back to you, uh, and then you lose somebody who's never coming back. You know, it just kind of it kind of wears on you. Oh yeah. Uh, and then losing my mother, you know, it was kind of. Um, it was a kick in the groin, I'd say. And what I found is after my mom's funeral, I was back at Fort Wainwright, Alaska, um, and I'm still sleep deprived at this point. We're talking months without, without any real sleep. And I went back to Alaska, uh, getting ready for my unit to return home, and went to the Class 6 store, which is like a liquor store on base, got a case of beer, and drank till I passed out. And then that became my routine for quite a while. Um, so, you know, I would say the guys came back in, there was, um, a lot of issues on the base. Every time a unit redeploys, all your alcohol related incidences go through the roof. Um, you know, people make really piss poor decisions when they're under the influence. We are getting a lot of DUIs, domestic violence, um, right. things of that nature. And, you know, I had two two actually actually four soldiers after coming home we ended up having to chapter out of service um for conduct issues and it was typically drug or alcohol related wow. so you lose half your guys in combat and then you lose the other half when you get home um and i just you know i kind of found myself in a position where uh, i was single i wasn't married and had no children at the time and i'm living off base in a basement apartment in uh, in Fairbanks, Alaska, and, and we're going through a long winter cycle. Um, they refer to eight months out of the year as the drinking months in Fairbanks because it's dark, right? Um, and that's a pretty common practice up there. That's why they have a high suicide rate. And I kind of got up almost a year back and realized things weren't getting any better. You know, I was still um, I kind of isolated. I didn't really do a lot of socializing, uh, and I drank a lot by myself. You know, that was kind of like the routine. And, and I just kind of got to the point where I was, I was tired of it. I was, I made a decision, um, you know, as a leader, you know, you can't really ask for help. And especially in the military and law enforcement culture, because the moment you do, you know, your damaged goods, there's a stigma that's attached to it. And, um, but I would, break I, mean, I would do it. You're right. Yeah. We're trying to crush the stigma. Absolutely. Um, and there's a lot of good things on the horizon. But long story short on that piece, I, I made a decision that, well, you know, I'm not married. I got no kids. It's been a good run. You know, I was a mama's boy, so I was ready to check out. And March 2nd of 2013, I was looking at a rifle in the corner of my room. And 
I just, one second, it's over. And thank God I heard the kids running on the ceiling above me, on, on, my, on my ceiling, their floor. And I was like, what am I, you know, it's like bad choice, you know, different day, different time. You know, I had to change tactics on that because I didn't want to hurt a kid or their parents. And then the next morning, I got a phone call from uh, Ryan. He was my, my driver in Afghanistan and one of my riflemen. Uh, said, Sergeant Jarvis, did you hear about Corey? And anytime that question is, is asked in the military context, there's two things that have happened. Somebody either got arrested or they're dead. And Corey had shot and killed himself that same night. So Corey was in the platoon that I had, I had actually just come out of and was a happy kid. Nobody had any idea. I mean, I think his close circle of friends knew, but nobody in leadership knew that he was struggling because he never gave any indicators that he was struggling. And, and I always say, Corey saved my life. Unfortunately, it's when he took his own because watching the kids um, go through the memorial service and how it affected the men, you know, I, I didn't want to be, um, I did not want to give any of my guys permission to do the same thing. So I just kind of fought through it. And 9-11, 2014, I was medically retired out of military service. So I had to take the uniform off, uh, came back home. Um, I made, actually made a decision I was going to come back into law enforcement um, one of my soldiers, his name is Donnie, his father was the Seminole County Sheriff, Don Esslinger Sr., and I got to know him and his family because Donnie was one of my wounded warriors, and his father came up to Alaska after our, um, our um, deployment to attend the battalion uh, ball. So I was his escort. He kind of convinced me to come back into law enforcement, and I was like, well, you know, I got to do something, you know, so I did. I made the decision, um, you know, Went back to school, had to go back through the academy all over again with a bunch of 19-year-old kids. I wanted to oh, yeah. choke, choke half of them, um, different, different, different times, different, different people. Um, but went back into law enforcement, and I um, ended up meeting my wife uh, just before I got the job at the sheriff's office. Uh, and she actually worked for the same agency. She worked as an uh, administrator. So you know, things started getting better. You know, I realized I've got to do something to take care of my health. So, you know, going back to the gym, being, doing physical things, you know, trying to break that um, pattern of just drinking all the time, um, trying to eat healthier, you know, you got your mind, your body and your spiritual life, you got to keep in check. And, you know, and we ended up getting married. Um, and we went on a blind date. It was literally, uh, January 17th of 2015, and uh, we went to, we got married April 16th of 2016, so, um, and things were going well, and I was still working in the sheriff's office, and, you know, my wife realized that, you know, I wasn't, I had a, I had a quick temper sometimes, not with her, but for just, I, I really had a low tolerance for stupidity, and if somebody did something or said something, I was very quick to snap. And she knew that a hey, something's something you know is a right. You know, a lot of a lot of law enforcement were like that anyway. You right. get tired of people people being stuck on stupid, and you know, and I was having issues too at the time. I have um, uh, what they call spinal stenosis, which is a bundle of nerves on the lower back that would um, basically shoot sciatic pain, like literally down my whole left side. And you know, my wife and I talked about it. The gun belt just didn't. Um, you know, caused a lot of the issues. So I decided I got vested in the Florida retirement system. Let me, um, you know, let me go ahead and put my papers in. Let's get out. I did two more years. Uh, Cause when I left, I needed 10 years to get vested. And then they changed the law to six right. and I was sitting at like four and a half. So I basically went back and, and finished up the vestment. So I get another pension at 55. And, and then when I left the sheriff's office, everything came back. Um, you know, they say the idle mind is the devil's playground. And boy, that's, that's so true because that honey-do list could only get so long. And, and then I found myself with a lot of time. And, and with all that time, it's nothing but the thoughts coming back. So my, you know, nightmares started coming back. I mean, I would sweat so bad, my sheets would be drenched. My wife would have to rub my back in the middle of the night because I'm, I'm literally like jumping and barking orders in bed, you know. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I had never really shared my military experiences with my wife because I really didn't want to. It's kind of like cops don't want to tell their spouses right. what they do during the day. But she asked me to, you know, hey, what happened over there? You know, so I, I shared my story with her. Her eyes kind of got real big and and uh, decided that 
she, she said, you're either gonna have to get help or I am because I don't know how to deal with this. I'm like, what, these aren't normal behaviors? You know, that, they were normal to me, you know? Right. So I was like, okay, you know, I didn't want to screw up my relationship with my wife. So I decided to uh, go to the VA and, and schedule an appointment. And what ended up happening was, you know, they tell you, to, well, tell me about a specific event. I, I ended up being diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder with major depressive disorder. But the only thing I heard in the whole conversation was disorder, disorder. You know, those are words that I didn't want to hear. And because now it's like, now what do you do? So, of course, the VA, the first thing I want to do, here's a prescription. You know, go fill the prescription, take some meds. That's, that's block one. And then they have you um, go to a counselor and then just tell talk, talk therapy. Or they called it prolonged exposure. And it started making things significantly worse for me because you know, we suppress a lot of things. And as we start, you know, digging up those old memories, you know, it was, things were starting to get a little bit worse. And I mean, they were just ridiculous things like sit in your office and listen to taps for an hour by yourself. And I'm like, uh, you know, you're, you're kidding me, right? Really? You know, yeah. It was just like crazy homework assignments. Go to a restaurant and sit with your back to a door. Like no time out. That's, that's not happening. You know? Yeah. Uh, they, they just try to tell you to do these things so that you see that nothing bad happens and then your brain realizes, you know, okay. you're pretty more, I was curious what the logic was on that. Cause that's interesting. I mean, obviously most cops and military sit with their back to the door in a restaurant anyway. Right. I was just curious yeah. on the logic on that. Well, I mean, you, you, you see all these active shooters and whatnot. You know, I don't want to, I want to know where my exits are. I want to know who's in there. I mean, that's just the, the nature of that. Um, so anyways, the, the VA had canceled a couple appointments and um, first appointment they canceled, I couldn't get in for another four weeks. And it's supposed to be done once a week for 16, 12 to 16 weeks. And then I went back for another couple appointments and then they called to cancel another appointment. And then it was like eight weeks before I could get back in. So I just like, I'm, I'm done. I, you know, I, I told them, I'll give you guys a call back and you know, we'll, we'll, I'll see what my schedule looks like. And that was it. I never called them back and they never called me back either. So, um, that was in 2017 and I peace out, said, see you later on the VA. And, um, but we're, my wife realized I wasn't going. And so we were still looking for other solutions. So, I mean, I went through EMDR, I went, which is the, the light going back and forth. And that really didn't do anything at all. It was kind of had me all over the place. Uh, and then my wife ended up uh, bringing a gentleman to the sheriff's office for some leadership training for sergeants and above. And cause that's one of her responsibilities with professional development. And uh, he was a retired Lieutenant Colonel uh, Green Beret. And we ended up going out to dinner cause she kind of shared my story with him. And, and then he invited me to come to a, um, a men's leadership retreat weekend. And at that, retreat, the uh, first gentleman that came up and introduced himself to me, his name is Tom Padilla. He was out in Albuquerque, New Mexico, started talking to me about a project he's working on um, with a new treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. And he didn't know my story. He didn't even know me, but um, I, was, I was listening keenly at what he was talking about. And, um, and after that weekend, I realized that I wanted to work with veterans. I wanted to work with first responders um, because that's the people that I'm comfortable around. Right. And it's also a, a large group of people that need services that just don't seem to be readily available. Um, and, and part of, um, you know, trying to crush the stigma and getting people being willing to get treated and whatnot. I mean, that's, that's a, a feat in itself. And so any, anyways, I started the nonprofit. It was April um, 15th of 2018. Um, we incorporated, um, actually it was April 18th. And, and then it was just basically, you know, at that point, trying to find alternative treatments, trying to find something out there that's effective. Um, and in September of 2018, I was invited to go out to Albuquerque by that gentleman, Tom Padilla, um, to watch the first training because the research and recognition project, they're the ones that developed this new treatment, um, invited me to come out and check it out. And I sat through the very the first full day of training um, and it was more a lot of the academic stuff. And then they do some clinical skills, like learning how to build rapport with people and break, breaking emotional states and stuff like that. Uh, right. But they started making some claims about the effectiveness of the treatment that sounded uh, a little too good to be true. And 
they they were claiming uh, 92 percent, 96 percent success rates, um, depending upon which study you looked at, because they had five replication studies that they published. So I second day of class, I tell the trainer, the lead trainer, that hey, uh, you guys are making some pretty bold claims. Um, you know, if if I'm gonna you know recommend anybody to do this, I, I wanna I wanna go through it. And he said, how about today? I said, sure, I'll, I'll do it today. He goes, how about in 10 minutes? I'm like, yeah, why, why not? And he goes, how about in front of the class? And I just kind of hesitated. I said, yep, I'm good. Let's do it. So I literally went and sat in front of a class of mental health counselors. There was about 25 or 30 of them in the class. And they did this process. And I was probably sitting there for about 45 minutes and looking like, what the heck just happened? And because when the guy finished, we were done. He says, all right, now tell me about the event. And I told the event and there was no negative emotions whatsoever in the event. And I'm like, okay, what kind of Jedi stuff is this? You know? Yeah. And that's the process. And that night, I mean, the sleep restores to normal. Um, nightmares go away. The thoughts don't pop in your head all the time. And, you know, obviously there's a more than one event in my, my life that I've had, I wanted to work on. Um, so when I got back to Florida, uh, four of the trainers that, or four of the counselors that were out there were from Florida and I connected with one of them. She was an air force vet and I went and I did like four more sessions with her and, I, and I'm like, there's nothing left after five sessions. Like literally, you know, most of the, the, the worst stuff in my past was childhood stuff, you know, things that I had no control over. Right. And, and then I, it's like, but it was all gone. I mean, you, you just can't seem to find it anymore. Um, so it's super cool. And, and part of what we do as an organization is we try to stand in the gap and provide connection points for um, people who need the help and people who have the abilities. And we try to marry them up. Uh, so a lot of them, we're looking for funding sources for veterans. We're looking for um, first responders who are willing to get treated. And we were going pretty solid for about a year. We, um, we ended up, we went down to um, uh, Coral Springs ahead of the anniversary of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. And we did some fundraising down there and we put together a training for counselors in that area. So I think we got 25 counselors down there trained um, to help with the, the first responders down there with the, the students at the high school where the shooting occurred and right. um, which went very well, but you know, it, it was still, there's still something so frustrating about that. You know, the ability to get into the, the avenues that you need to, to, to let people become aware of this, it's very difficult. So um, what ended up happening in Florida is um, Don Esslinger, his wife, Elise, uh, had her, her son was killed in a traffic crash. Um, not the soldier that I worked with, but her son, his, his stepson. And she was just a wreck. And I, I remember first after going through the, finding the, the successes of the stuff, I went back to, I called Sheriff Esslinger and I said, hey, sir, I said, uh, you know, I, I'd like to connect at least with somebody that, that might be able to help her. So I ended up going up to Tallahassee where he lives now. He's, he's um, executive director for the Florida Sher Sheriff's Risk Management Fund. So I went there, hung out with Donnie, his son, and then shared my story with Elise. And, you know, we ended up getting her connected and uh, literally took care of her trauma. And so now we have a credible source that knows how this works. So, you know, with the help of Don Esslinger, you know, now we're able to get into places where we couldn't get in before. So, um, for example, he's got to put it through their board of directors, but, you know, they want to host a training for smaller sheriff's offices that don't have the budgets for this because we now are able to take this into um, government agencies. Like, we can now train um, first responders to do this, and we can train veterans to do this on a peer-to-peer -peer level through the nonprofit because the state of Florida gives licensing exemptions. So, you know, we went up to Tallahassee, we did the first training December of 2019, where we had seven licensed counselors along with seven non-licensed um, veterans or first responders. So uh, we raised the funds, we, we got the, uh, the veterans trained. Uh, since then, the, there was two licensed in that group. One was an ex-cop up in St. Louis, 
and one was a is licensed was a um, National Guard um, lieutenant or officer. And between the two there and then the seven or the six veterans, um, we're talking over 120 people so far have been treated. Wow. And so we're talking like now we're making impacts. Um, the, our return on investment is based upon how much um, each person that gets treated, what the cost is, and we average that into what we pay for the, uh, the peer coaches. So all, all of our peer coaches, there's no fees, there's no charge of anything. So okay. you know, we, we paid you know, one of the guys up in Massachusetts, $1,500 to get him trained. He's already treated 20 people. So we're talking first responders, veterans, and civilians. We're finding a lot of civilians are asking for help. And we're not, we don't turn them away because they need it just as badly as anybody else. Right. Um, but so for less than, a, you know, less than 90 bucks a person, they're losing PTSD. We have one counselor. She's an Air Force veteran. She's a doctor of psychology, um, industrial and organizational psychology. Uh, since June, January 9th, she's treated 50 people wow. of this year. So, when you talk those 120, are you still seeing that 90% plus success rate? Yes. I I've myself have worked with 25 people, and I have not had a failure yet. That's awesome. Very, very but, good. So let me ask you, I want to go back just a little bit, um, because in your story, which, by the way, is just um, very powerful, so I appreciate you sharing um, what you went through. In fact, when I read it, uh, it was pretty incredible. Some of the vignettes, like when you described hearing the pitter patter of feet upstairs, I mean, yeah. powerful, powerful stuff. Let me, um, let me ask you though, when it comes to red flags, when you're dealing with PTS or PTSD, depending on how you want to use the acronym, um, do you, you, you mentioned like drug and alcohol related things with a lot of these guys, the isolation, are those all red flags typically for PTS? Yes, the, the drug and alcohol consumption is a self-medication mechanism. Um, guys want to calm down. They don't want these thoughts constantly bombarding them. So drink, you know, lack of sleep. Sleep deprivation is really big. Insomnia is really big with people that have PTS. Um, so a lot of people are trying to, you know, numb it a little bit and then just try to push through the day, you know. Right. Yeah. Of course, okay. we, we know alcohol is a depressant anyway, and it's counterintuitive. It's counterproductive. Absolutely. And, and it seems like, at least in my anecdotal experience, those always do seem to be contributing factors to these issues. Yeah. Um, but I know with what you guys are dealing with, I was just kind of curious if you're seeing those on a larger scale as well as being red flags of, hey, maybe it's time we need to reach out and talk to somebody. Yeah, definitely um, in the military environment, excessive alcohol consumption was cause for concern. Uh, one, because they're making really bad choices. You know, you don't want a family to be affected. You don't want their kids at home to be affected. So, um, you know, we had one guy who every weekend he's coming to work with a new black eye. So oh. he's going out, he's getting drunk, and he's constantly getting into fights. Yeah. So that, you know, you try to talk to these folks. Um, that gentleman ended up getting sent to a detox because he had like a 0.22 blood alcohol at work okay. and he was talking as normal as we're talking now he was a totally functioning alcohol um so there's a lot of that um yeah that's definitely red flags okay definitely. um when you were at the so what uh what roles did you were you just on patrol then or what roles did you have at the so in your time in law enforcement? Uh, my first four years i basically changed up every year I, my first year i did patrol my second year i did community oriented policing we're talking back in the 90s on the bikes right. and stuff back with the, those cute shorts that they made us wear. And then, well, of course. Um, yeah. and then I worked street crimes and then I worked narcotics. Uh, second time going back, uh, I went right through training, right into the crime suppression team. So um, right into an unmarked car and, you know, working crappy hours and making drug arrests. So yes, those are my predominant areas that I did. Okay. And that seems to be pretty, I know in my story as well, same thing. Uh, but I always like to ask those questions for you because obviously the law enforcement officers listening to this are going to be curious. Uh, but sure. we tend to do the same thing. We bounce around from role to role, even yeah. though obviously the face of the agency is patrol and uh, right. what they accomplish. So when we talk about first responders, when we talk about law enforcement, what has been the receptiveness to this? I know you talked about being able to um, 
through the story with Miss Esslinger. Esslinger. Essling, yeah, Esslinger. Least. Sorry about that. Um, but Don't getting it. But what has been the receptiveness in the law enforcement community? It's a mixed reception. You have one hand, you have those like Sheriff Esslinger left Seminole County. So I was able to go meet with Sheriff Dennis Lima. And he's a former Marine himself. And he was totally open to, um, he's like, I want this for my agency. I want 20 deputies to get trained to do this. So they're going to probably be the first, uh, the pilot group to go through for first responders. Um, Winter Haven Police Chief, uh, Chief Bird, an anomaly when it comes to police chiefs. He totally cares about the mental health of his, of his officers. Um, if somebody's having some issues, he will not fire them if they're undergoing counseling because of the message it will send to, even if they did something that warranted getting fired. So you get people like that, and then other agencies, no, we're good. We don't have any problems with, with mental health. You know, our, our deputies are solid, you know. So, yeah. It's there's amazing. still that stigma out there, unfortunately. There's still, yep. and like I think we even talked when we were in Orlando, there's definitely some proactive agencies out there. I'm very blessed to be at one that is um, right. very proactive in the mental health side but in doing this podcast and talking with agencies across the country sadly you're right there's still a lot of agencies that don't want to admit there is a problem or could be a problem well if we're losing more first responders to suicide than line of duty deaths there's a problem absolutely and sadly no, in the last couple of years those numbers have shown that yep and i think one of the good benefits of the florida's changing their state law with workplace injury is going to force agencies to become a little bit more proactive because in the state of Florida, there's 56 counties that are self-insured. That's okay. through the Florida Sheriff's Risk Management Fund. So if somebody gets diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, they could be on the hook um, compensating through workers' comp for quite a while. So the, the interesting thing about the, the reconsolidation of traumatic memories, it's literally an 89 line script. It's a process. Okay. And you can reset the emotional state after an event within 24 hours. So, you know, if you work a, a triple homicide and there's a couple dead children in the, in the house, you can literally work through that emotional state within 24 hours. Now, really? not everybody needs it, you know, because 70% um, of the people out there, they know how to dissociate to the events and they don't take that emotional state on, but you still are stuck with 30% you know, between 15 and 30, who actually will fully associate into the event. And then we're also looking, we're also finding more and more veterans and first responders who've had what they refer to as ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. So if you had an adverse childhood experience as a kid, whether it was a single event or multiple, uh, your likelihood of fully associating into the emotion of the event is pretty high. So the, the, the great thing is you can treat all of that, you know, like with me, five sessions and I was done. I've done one session with some people and did more than one traumatic event and they were finished after a single session. They didn't need to go in for two, three or four. So it just really depends on the person, um, how, how much trauma they're carrying. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, Dr. Burke with a research and recognition project is in the process of, publication with the APA and what he's trying to do is get post-traumatic stress disorder, the anxiety disorders, um, all of those disorders removed from the DSM-5 manual, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Right. Um, for, for mental health orders, or disorders, because he says they're not psychological, they are actually neurological, which is why the RTM is so successful, because it's not psychological counseling. It's basically, he, they refer to it as a neurological intervention. Because um, trauma, people don't realize uh, the base part of your brain, that's your amygdala, that's your fight or flight or freeze response is stuck right in that little walnut sized part of your brain. You know, kind of, you know, when you're a kid and you put your hand in the fire and you burn it, you know, you know never to put your hand in fire again because that right. memory is stored right there. That's the same place that traumatic memories are stored. And in the process of the treatment, what, the, what it does is it puts the event in context on an unconscious level that the brain realizes, oh, wait a minute, there's a beginning to this event, there's an end to the event, and it's an old event. That's not what this is for. And it basically at that point will split the memory. Emotions will go to the one side of the brain, and the actual memory will go to the other side of the brain. 
and never two will they meet, they meet again. Wow. So whenever you recall memories in its long-term context, it makes the neurological connection stronger and stronger. So okay. pretty neat little neuroscience for you. Yeah, no, that is very fascinating. And, um, and I have some fact sheets and stuff that you had sent over to me, which I will make sure that I link up in the show notes for anyone um, that wants to go in deeper. Because it, it is absolutely fascinating. In fact, some of the facts that you've thrown out are written right on here that over 90% um, who have finished treatment with a measured loss of PTSD diagnosis, nightmares, flat, flashbacks, and directly related mo- emotional symptoms, and goes on to... Uh, state that this protocol requires no drugs and is typically less than three sessions, which is amazing. Cause like you said, that's not the typical response. As soon as someone gets diagnosed, it's, Hey, Hey, let me give you these pills or whatever the yeah. case may be. This is totally unconventional next generation stuff. I love it. What? Um, and that's why I wanted to have you on the show. Cause I think this is so powerful and it's a different way of thinking, which mm-hmm. is what we need to do. You know, sometimes, um, you know, we are a hundred years of tradition uninterrupted by progress in this. Business. So <laughs> yeah. it's sometimes, and sometimes it's good, you know, stick with the old ways and so forth. But like you said, we've got to crush the stigma, break the stigma. And we've got to, I don't like the word progressive, but we've got to be forward thinking in how sure. we attack things. Absolutely. Um, when you talk about uh, disassociation and so forth, is there any science or anything that comes out of this with time to event? So in other words, if the guys are involved in a major incident, um, whatever it is, be a death of a child or be it an active shooter type situation, is there any science as far as how quickly they should be con- spoken to and then how quickly they should go through this program? Well, that's one of the questions uh, with Dr. Burke. I, I've asked him directly, how soon after an event can you do this? And he said, you can do it within 24 hours. Wow. So you can, because what it does is it separates the emotions from the memories. And if you have the emotions um, tomorrow and you have post-traumatic stress, you're going to have the same emotions in 10 years. So if you can fix it in 10 years, why can't you fix it in a day? So yeah, I'd say one, within one to two days, you can, you can successfully run through the protocol. Is and then the cool thing. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I said one of the cool things is once you actually go through the treatment, you're training your brain a new skill. So the brain will start automatically doing that same work on future events, if that even makes sense. It does. Yeah, because yeah, like you said, because in a way, it's a sort of disassociation as well. Am I correct in yes. that? Yes. It's really creating, like you said, to separate the emotions. Mm-hmm. from the event in a lot of ways that is disassociation that's that's the success behind the treatment is you they don't want you fully associated into the trauma to fix it it actually will take considerably longer you want to get you basically want to get a little bit of the story where they have that parasympathetic reaction do what they call the break state get them out of the story get them on some other subject and then you have a four to six hour window that you can run the protocol and what ends up happening is you pull the emotion out of the event and then there's an end piece to it where they have you rescript an alternate ending. And that's not changing the events. That's just they want you to think about something more positive. And what ends up happening is that positive feeling that you get on the new memory you create imprints over the old memory and then will clear out the um, subconscious crap. Right. And then every time you recall the event, whatever you felt on the new memory is now what's stuck in your, in your brain. Okay. Is there any kind of pre, I know that it's a series of questions or steps that it takes you through. Is there any kind of pre test for lack of a better word that determines if somebody needs to, or should go through this? Yeah. There's what's called the PSSI five. That's it's a, um, it's the, I I don't know the terminology for it, but that's what the mental health world uses to give a clinical uh, diagnosis for PTSD. So do you have, um, un- disturbing thoughts, how often? Do you have nightmares, how often? And you score everything out. And then if you score anything over like 20, um, you are, you're at the low end. If you're up in the 40s and 50s, you're pretty good. And then there's some that go up into the 70s. Okay. So uh, depending on how high you score, over 20 will determine what category of PTSD there is. Typically in the licensed mental health world, they won't test you with, until 30 days later. Because 30 days... Basically, they call that an acute period. 
and most people will progress back to a normal emotional state after that 30 days. And, but for the perspective of the first responder world, uh, you could do it as a preventative measure is basically what you're doing. Okay. So, you know, what you're doing when you're in PTS, you're, you're in fight or flight 24 seven, whether you're awake or whether you're asleep. So your, your body is spitting cortisol, your body is doing all kinds of stuff um, that are, that have negative impacts on your health, you know, heart attacks, heart disease, strokes, cancers, a lot of those are what they call comorbid diseases associated with stress. And right. that's another reason why a lot of your law enforcement have health issues. Because they're always spitting cortisol. They're always in a stress reaction mode. Right. Whether they're off duty or on duty. Interesting. And I was going to ask that. That was actually one of the questions I was going to go towards is because at least from my understanding and what I've heard is that law enforcement has a different type of PTF because it's more cumulative in the way right. that our career works as opposed to somebody who deploys and maybe in a couple major actions or whatever the case may be overseas. Yeah. Is that what you're seeing as well in your research? It's, it's a different type of PTS, but it would still qualify. I mean, because when you're deployed overseas, they will not give you a, di a clinical diagnosis of PTSD until you've returned because you're still going through it. So that's kind of the same thing that, that law enforcement or firefighters would fall into because you have it for 30 years, your career, you know. Right. But um, back to what I was saying, if you can identify a significant traumatic event or a first traumatic event, whether you're going through or not, you can still clear the trauma. So that accumulation can be resolved with treatment. So um, say you, you had an event when you were 10 and you clear that event and then you had a really bad shooting or something, you clear that event. And what they call is the gestalt. It's like a string of pearls. You pull one out and the rest fall away. Okay. So, which is why you can go through three to five sessions and, and take care of complex trauma. I mean, we're talking like seriously complex trauma in a very short period of time. Wow. So I even if it's it. cumulative, even if it's cumulative, it'll work. You just got to identify a couple of different events and then your brain starts learning how to do it on its own. And then it'll start filing things away without even realizing. Okay. What is, what is the mission of 22 to zero? What is your mission? 22 zero is our mission is to become irrelevant as an organization. We're on average 22 veteran suicides a day in the United States. Uh, we're trying to get that to zero. And when we do, I can go on to another mission. Okay. That's great. I love that. What um, I've noticed on there that you mentioned a couple different programs that you have. You have the ART and RTM with the accelerated resolution therapy yep. and reconsolidation of traumatic memories, which we've kind of spoken about. You also mention a bridge builder program and battle buddy program. Can you go a little deeper into those? Yeah, the battle buddy program, initially it started off um, with a concept of um, just connecting other veterans as they get out of service. Because that first 18 months is their most critical time. And because that's when a lot of them isolate, they can't reintegrate back into, into the, the normal culture. So trying to get groups of people that can mentor other veterans. And that basically um, morphed into our peer coaching program. Okay. So instead of the battle buddy program, we're now, you know, we're assigning a peer coach to a veteran. They can and mentor them at the same time, treat them. Um, so that's, that's what the battle buddy program is. That really came out of frustration because, um, we were we were sponsoring counselors to get trained, and um, since September of 2018, there's only about 180 nationally trained, and there should be five times that. But we, we've struggled trying to get counselors to buy into something new, even with the research. You know, it's like everybody thinks that they've got the latest and greatest, best thing, and and are very closed-minded. So that's why we started looking at other options, and we went to the um, outside the the box thinking and, and started training. I, I'd much rather pay a veteran, pay for a veteran to get trained to do this, where we treat somebody for free than pay for somebody who gets paid to do this for a living that doesn't want to pay for their own training. Right. So oh, I think that's wonderful. People that want to get involved in that, in the peer coaching, how do they go about that? Uh, they just have to contact me directly. They can send an email, dan at 220.org. That's 220.org. Um, they can call me. All my information's on the website. 
And it basically would depend on where we get the trainings. So like the next training for Florida is going to be St. Augustine. Um, okay. And that one's going to be a good one because we're going to have 20 National Guard members from the Florida National Guard that's going to be there um, that are not licensed. So, and, you know, one of the, one of the sergeants from the sheriff's office locally here that got trained to do it, she's in the National Guard and got them to approve it. We've already trained a couple active duty Air Force members as well that aren't counselors. So we're just going way outside the box, you know. That's good. How long does the actual training itself, like how long is that? Is it a day? It's four day training. Okay. It's a, it's a four day training. And what it is, is Dr. Burke specializes in program learning. So it's very similar to the way military trains, crawl, walk, run. So you crawl and then you start walking and then by the time you're done, they have to do two full sessions of RTM with, with another uh, person in the class with them. So the cool part is once we start doing this with the first responders, they're going to see how easy and effective it is because they'll have to do to work with their own garbage. Right. And, uh, and then once, once they start talking on the, on the junior, on the ground level, you know, that's when people will start realizing, okay, maybe I can fix this. Because as quickly as that breaker switches and you have PTS, they can, they can switch right back off. Wow. So if that's the case, how is it psychological? And what do you say to the person? Because I'm sure, because you know, they're all skeptics. We are all skeptics. Sure. So what, what do you say to that person who's a little skeptical right now and says this is too good to be true? Uh, well, the decision is ultimately yours to make whether you want to go through it or not. And that's been a, a pretty big pill for me to swallow because I know I can help some people, but they just won't. They, they don't believe it. Uh, the thing is, is if you believe in it or not, it's not really relevant. If you go through the process, the brain does it automatically. So if you're that skeptical, just try it out. You know, if they come through the nonprofit 220, you know, we don't charge any money and we can, we can do it as we're doing this right here. Okay. Um, through like a, a Zoom or a Skype call, providing somebody's not actively suicidal, we would, we would, they would have to be with somebody. Right. Absolutely. Um, but but yeah, I mean, it's just a matter of actually doing the process. And that's why we do our, we do our own podcast called the PTSD free podcast. And that's to tell the stories of people who um, have gone through it. Matter of fact, we just released our last one was a police officer that's up in Virginia um, and she's from the UK and she went through the RTM and uh, great podcast. So the stories, that's, that's where the power comes from. And that's what, Typically, the reason we do the podcast, somebody will say, hey, can you help my husband or help my wife? And then the first question I ask, do they want help? And that's the big thing is a lot of us think we're, we're good, we're fine, until we're not, you know. Right. So we'll let them, hey, have them listen to the podcast. And, you know, they may listen to two or three and then get up enough courage to say, okay, you know, sign me up, what do I do? And then we connect them with somebody. That's it. That's all there is to it. That's awesome. And, and then we try to get them to do a podcast when they're done. Yeah. And that's, and I'm going to link all that up in the show notes so people can look those up. In fact, that was going to be one of my next questions is, is there a success story that stands out to you more than any other ones? Is there that one that it's like, this is, this is amazing. Uh, I, there's, I would say three or four that we've done that are pretty compelling. Um, the one with a police officer is, is really good because, you know, she, she speaks the language and, you know, it was great. The one with, we have a, the, the, doctor of the industrial organizational psychologist, uh, the Air Force vet, hers was very powerful too, because she breaks down even better a lot of the science of what they're doing. Um, and then I've had one, um, one gentleman that we got treated, who actually got trained, it's called You're Worth It, that's a good podcast. I, I would say I got about five or six of them that are really solid. Okay. So, well, and I will encourage um, any of my listeners that are listening to this and are a little bit skeptical or a little bit unsure, like you said, the best way to do it, let's listen to the success stories. And then if you're struggling or if you're in a place where nothing else is working, what harm is there in reaching into this and seeing it? If mm -hmm. it works for you, and obviously the science that I'm going to put on the website is there. And if it works, why not? Why not at why least not? try? One of the cool things, uh, I'll, I'll leave you with this, the, and, and this is a part of the people that they really don't quite understand. You can do the protocol on somebody without them even telling, saying a single word, right? Like just, just by what, right, think about the event. And once you see them have that reaction, and then you can run the protocol. Don't even have to tell me what happened. Wow. That's awesome. Let me, in uh, 
just as a matter of closing a question, I ask everybody, uh, what is the one takeaway, the one thing that law enforcement officers can do that's going to make a difference in their personal lives? Take control of your mental health. Don't just dismiss it. Very good. No, that's great advice and very powerful. Um, I know you've mentioned it a few times, but what's the easiest and best way for people to connect with you? Uh, they can send me an email to dan at 220.org. My cell phone is 863-221-6304. And we're, our website is 220.org. Perfect. I appreciate it, Dan. And I'll have all that linked up in the show notes. I really appreciate you coming on today. I appreciate you letting me on. Thanks, Dan. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.